afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to be talking about something that happened to me while working on one of the many packages in the uh, mobile subrepository. Uh, and I've titled the talk Living with C because uh, it's something that uh, you can't avoid in the mobile subrepository. The first thing you need to ask is, do you need to use C at all? Uh, and this is a very important question because we have a nice general purpose programming language called Go that you can write things in. And it's pretty good at what it does. Uh, and it's reasonably expressive, covers most of the cases that matter to us. And you have ways out when you uh, get stuck. Uh, you have an assembler which lets you represent any uh, uh, instruction you might need to send to your uh, machine that you can't express with Go. Uh, and, you know, it's a nice language. It's a, it's a newer language than C, and it has features that are, are of great value, uh, like uh, memory safety, uh, that are worth using. Uh, and you can almost always avoid C. Uh, if you look at Go, Go is written in Go, the compiler is written in Go, the runtime is written in Go, the standard library is written in Go, except, except the occasional call into C. Um, and these calls are optional. Not sure what I'm doing. I think it's just because I'm mentioning using two programming languages together. It's not a, <laughs> not a thing. So, uh, so, uh, so, so the calls in the standard library in C are very rare and are always optional. And they're like, uh, when the big one, of course, is DNS resolution. Uh, DNS resolution uses uh, the uh, your libc if it's available because uh, large fractions of a uh, of interesting network, interesting network configuration is implemented in user land. Uh, for example, your proxy server set up on your, on your Mac uh, is done entirely in user land, and if you don't use a libc resolver, uh, nothing works. So uh, uh, that's where you have to use C. But when you're writing a, a network server on a Linux machine, you don't have to use C. I don't use C, and I don't want to. Uh, I don't do any C go. Uh, uh, at Google, where we have a large chunk of legacy C++ code that we link against, uh, uh, our favorite technique is to bundle it up into a separate process and talk to it through an RPC system. Uh, and this gives you wonderful separation of concerns, uh, it makes you really think about the API, and means when you have a memory corruption bug over in C, it doesn't corrupt some part of the runtime and give you an inscrutable error from, from Go. Unfortunately, mobile operating systems are a great example of where you need to use a lot of C all the time. And this is because large fractions of the surface area of the operating system are only exposed through user land C APIs. Uh, on Android, your main entry point of your process actually comes with the operating system. It's a process that's shipped, it's a binary that's shipped with it. It starts, it starts inside C++ in the art runtime. Starts some Java, which then loads your shared library and then starts your Go. So uh, you're not gonna get away from having C in process with you, and large numbers of APIs are only accessible that way. On iOS, uh, you actually get control of the entry point, and so you could avoid using C altogether, but if you don't call into a special Objective-C function within three seconds of your app starting, uh, the operating system kills the app because it assumes it's non-responsive. So you really have to use C on these platforms. Uh, and this is a particularly good example of using C, and this is the GL package, and it is a, uh, it is a wrapper around OpenGL ES 2.0, a wrapper of sorts. It, it gives you a series of Go functions that call into uh, the matching C functions. OpenGL ES 2 is a way to draw on the screen. It's a restricted subset of uh, modern OpenGL. So modern OpenGL is a, they took a subset of the original GL, they added a programming language to it. Uh, they called it simpler or more complex, depending who you are. Uh, GL ES2 is the, the purest essence of this modern approach. Uh, and it's incredibly portable, uh, incredibly portable. It's incredibly portable for a graphics API. It works on Android, it works on iOS, it works on your desktop. Uh, and uh, it uh, gets you to the graphics processing unit. And there's no, there's no other way to get to the GPU. Uh, you can't make a system call to the kernel and get to the GPU. You have to use these user land C APIs. Now, it's really simple, and it's, it's a great example of why mixing programming languages is hard, because it's a series of C functions that take integers and take pointers to byte arrays, and uh, that's it. There's no complex data structures. It should be really easy to wrap, and what it looks like is this. You get a couple hundred functions that uh, are simply called directly into the C, and that was the entire GL package. It was really easy to write, I was very happy about that and I moved on to other problems um, and started using it. Uh, and it basically worked, uh, except for this. Now, this, uh, when you want to use, write an app entirely in Go, 
uh, with the mobile repository, you use this app package, which does all the work of setting everything up, getting your graphics context prepared for the screen, input devices, all the rest, and you hand it a draw function, which is responsible for every time it's time to redraw the screen, does some drawing. Uh, and it can make GL calls, and it makes GL calls to draw on the screen, and these two functions should be equivalent. Uh, according to Go, uh, the way we know Go, the way, the way we use uh, the Go, if you read the Go specification, if you read effective Go, you can do either of these things. The second one is kind of contrived, but it's the same thing. The first one calls GL clear color with some parameters, waits for it to return, and then exits. Uh, draw two uh, starts a Go routine, which calls GL clear color in the same way, and it waits for that Go routine uh, to have completed calling GL clear color and returns. They should both work, except the second one doesn't, it crashes. Uh, so something strange has gone on. We're not programming in Go anymore, because that should work. Uh, what we're programming in is a new programming language we've created, which is this interesting uh, melange of uh, Go and C. Uh, and the way it's been created is by uh, interactions between two implementation details of Go. The first is Go's uh, MN threading model, uh, and the second is C's thread local storage. Uh, now I'm going to try and explain both of these. Uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, MN threading uh, is how Go routines work. So if you've programmed both C, C++, Java, and Go, you'll know that a Go routine is not an operating system thread. Uh, there's some fundamental differences in how they're programmed. Uh, Go routines are really cheap. You can make as many as you like. I, I, would, I hesitate to say too cheap to meter because sometimes you need to meter them. But uh, uh, they're much cheaper than, for example, a network connection. Uh, in fact, when you get a network connection, you can create two or three of them, and I think the HTTP package does. Uh, Operating system threads, on the other hand, are heavy. You don't create a new one of these for every network connection you get, or if you do, you have a low QPS server. Uh, and this leads you in traditional C++ programming. When you're building a network server, uh, you, are, uh, you have a pool of operating system threads ready to handle uh, events, uh, and you use a callback style programming uh, to process network data when it comes in on a fixed pool of operating system threads. And your program is quite complicated. Uh, in Go, you don't have any of those problems. You just spawn a Go routine and it blocks until you know, the next piece of thing is on the network. And the way this works is you create Go routines uh, and they get put into work queues inside the runtime and the runtime in your process. And the runtime has a scheduler which is responsible for placing Go routines onto operating system threads. It can preempt uh, Go routines and move them onto other operating system threads or let others have a go. Uh, this is completely independent of the kernel scheduler which is doing something similar for operating system threads onto CPUs. So this is great, this is really key. It, it's a very old technique actually that was tried and the very early versions of Java had something called green threading which is MN threading and it was considered a performance uh, optimization uh, for operating system thread programming styles and it was not deemed worthwhile, it was too complex. Uh, but it's not, it's not used here as a performance optimization alone, it's used here to change the way you can program. You can write new things with Go routines that you can't write with operating system threads. And that's key, so this is really valuable. Second thing is thread local storage, uh, and this is not a concept we have in Go. Part of Go routines being really cheap, easy, you create them all the time, throw them away, is they have no notion of identity. I can't ask for a Go routine by its name or its number and do something like that. Uh, whereas in C, uh, uh, threads are expensive, and so they have this concept of thread local storage, which is uh, uh, a bunch of data that is associated uh, with threat. Now, if you're an old C programmer like me, this syntax may look a bit strange on the slide. Uh, this is C11 which it turns out uh, introduced this thread underscore local type qualifier, which matches the C++11 type qualifier. So they unified these by changing everything. Uh, and OpenGL makes uh, uh, heavy use of this, and it does because OpenGL is a very long-lived API. OpenGL uh, uh, comes from the days of processes having a single thread. And if you wanted multi-threading, you obviously you forked and you had two processes. Uh, it's a much simpler model because you don't have to share anything. It's, it's really quite lovely, uh, except it never seems to work. Uh, and so we end up with threads, tragically. Uh, and uh, what happened was OpenGL was a single process, single thread of control, uh, a bunch of functions which drew onto the graphics context. Uh, they introduced threads. They wanted to have multiple graphics contexts because OpenGL calls a stateful, a series of calls, a modifying, effectively, a background state machine. Uh, and when you wanted these threads to work independently on different parts of a scene, or different objects that will be put together in a scene later. Uh, and so they needed to add a parameter to all the GL functions, but of course that would break everything. So instead of adding a parameter to all of the GL functions, they put a parameter in thread local storage. And thread local storage here is, imagine if you had global variables, uh, you get one, uh, a name, V1, refers to a single, uh, 
uh, a single piece of memory for the entire process. The name V2 refers to a single piece of memory for each operating system thread, and you see a different value in each one. Uh, and so that's great. They managed to plumb something through the operating system threads uh, without breaking their API. Wonderful. Uh, really wonderful. Uh, except uh, when we come to Go, uh, because it is that thread local storage which is uh, coming, is, we were seeing before in our two draw falls, which is breaking the second one. And uh, what's going on is there's this code behind the scenes that I had hoped no one would have, ever have to look at, but I'm showing it now as a cautionary tale. Uh, and this is what happens in the app package at initialization. It starts a Go routine, a long-lived Go routine, who is, uh, calls this magic function runtime lock OS thread. And this changes the nature of the Go routine. At this point now, Go routines have identity. They have a name and a number. Uh, and a series of C calls can be made uh, on this, and they're on the same OS thread. So we, we start by loading the thread local storage for the OpenGL call, and then periodically call the draw function. Uh, the result of this, this magic lock OS thread, is this Go routine always runs on the same operating system thread. Uh, and the scheduler is now very sad, because all, all sorts of wonderful optimizations about swapping Go routines when re sending things over channels no longer works. Uh, but this is how we make the C work, and this is what's leaking through that API we designed earlier. Uh, there's, now a, there's now two different kinds of Go routines, and the user of the GL package always has to know this. It's always a problem, and you're no longer programming in Go, you're programming in Go, GL, C, look. And uh, that's not a place we want to be. We want to be programming in Go, because that's what everyone knows, and they don't expect these sort of surprises to come up and bite them when they're trying to program. So we want to get back to a world where you could make a GL call from any Go routine and get the same effect. So the first thing, we're gonna do a couple things to make this work. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do what OpenGL should have done originally and make uh, the context explicit. So we're gonna introduce uh, an object called gl.context uh, and we're gonna plumb it through everywhere. And when you wanna make a GL call, you make it to a method on this context uh, instead of this package level function that you use. Uh, so clear color now becomes a method on glctx. Uh, the second thing we're going to do is we're going to take that code in the app package that no one wanted to see and rearrange it into uh, uh, a driver thread that doesn't run user code. So this, this Go routine still calls lock OS thread to get, uh, to get uh, the, the stable thread local storage uh, identity, then uh, ID. And then uh, it will periodically read from a channel to see if work is available, and if it is, it will execute that work. Now work here is uh, a message that has been sent from the GL context to its worker. So every time you call GLCTX clear color, a message is sent through a channel uh, and put in a queue. This thread then executes that message. It calls the actual GL clear color function on this thread. So now we have uh, this thread isolated away. This is hidden in the implementation, uh, and no one who's using this has to think about this. You can kind of imagine this visually as a call can come from any Go routine, the one on the right to the locked Go routine, and all of this is not something that uh, leaks through the API. So now, to go back to the original code, uh, both of these work. Uh, I hope this can serve as a cautionary tale of how incredibly hard it is to mix these programming languages. When you put Go and C in the same process space and you use both of them, uh, you have all of Go and all of C and all of the interactions between the parts of them that weren't interacting before. Uh, and this is complicated, and this can be surprising. This was a surprise to me. It required uh, quite a rearrangement of the app package to, to fix this. Uh, but now it works, which is nice. Uh, and just, just to, uh, uh, as I have a minute, uh, that second draw function looks contrived. Why would this ever happen? Imagine I have a package who is very good at traversing over scene graphs, and it provides a, uh, a function which takes the scene graph uh, and it takes a closure which uh, is executed on each element of the graph. And that closure is what's doing the GL work. And imagine we're calling that in here. Uh, and as we walk over the scene graph, we execute this GL. Uh, and it works and everything is terrific until someone walks in and optimizes the scene graph package by using Go routines in the background to do some work concurrently. Uh, and now nothing works. And that's the big problem with these sorts of things leaking through APIs is they uh, they, they travel a long way and everything is fine and then they break very far away where you wouldn't expect them to. Okay, thank you. <laughs>